Thank you. So can everyone hear me fine through this microphone? Anyone who can't hear me, raise your hand. Oh, wait. Um, all good now? Okay. Um, so tonight I'll be speaking on a project I've been working on on and off for the past year or so, uh, which is the uh, question of what kind of addresses we'll be using in Bitcoin in the future. And uh, recently I proposed a BIP after uh, several long discussions among some people. And I, I think we have a great proposal. So today I'll be talking about uh, the proposal itself and how it came to be. Um, this was joint work with several people, uh, in particular Greg Maxwell, who's here as well. Um, and my employer is Blockstream, and as m most of this work was uh, done thanks to the computation power our, our computers uh, were able to do. I, I guess I should mention them. I'll talk about that more. So. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. Uh, first, I'll talk about why. Why do we need a new address type um, going forward? Uh, and the decision to use base32 rather than base58, as has been used historically. Uh, once the choice for base32 is made, there are a bunch of open design questions. One is what checksum we'll be using, what character set to use, and how the address looks uh, overall structured, and I'll go through them in this order, as you'll see that the uh, optimal character set really depends on the optimal choice of the checksum, which may be surprising. And then combine everything into uh, this new format, which I'll be calling Bash32. Okay, why? Um, segregated witness, as a, a proposal I uh, presented, a bit over a year ago in Hong Kong for the first time and is now in a, a state of perhaps being deployed on the Bitcoin network. Um, needs uh, new outputs and needs to encode new address types. Um, they're described in BIP143, pay to witness, pubkey hash, and pay to witness script hash, and there are a few extensions uh, possible later. Um, and SegWit supports two ways of using these, either uh, inside P2SH, which is an address type that has been supported for years on the Bitcoin network, making it backward and forward compatible with every uh, client, uh, every wallet out there created in the past few years. Um, however, going forward, we really want this to happen natively. Uh, this gives us uh, better efficiency for spending, as we don't need the uh, uh, overall uh, backward compatibility layer of the redeem script that P2SH requires. And secondly, it gives us 128-bit security for script hashes, which is something P2SH only uh, delivers 80 bits, which is becoming questionable. Uh, um, this proposal uh, replaces BIP 142, which was an older base 58 uh, based proposal, uh, and I think this is much better. So, why base 32? Uh, first of all, due to the more limited alphabet, we can uh, restrict ourselves to just lowercase or just uppercase, making the address format case insensitive. Uh, this makes it much easier to read or write. Uh, addresses down as anyone who has ever tried to write an address down or type it after someone reading it over a phone or something has has ever tried to easily confirm. To be clear, I my hope is that in the long term, Bitcoin doesn't need addresses anymore. That we'll get a, a real solution where humans don't need to interact with the cryptographic material uh, at all anymore. There have been proposals going in that direction, but it, it seems for the time being we're not there, so we need a solution regardless. Uh, 32 being a power of 2 means it's much easier to convert. We can just take the bits from the data, which are bytes, uh, split them into bits, rearrange them into groups of 5, take these groups of 5, and those become your base32 characters. 
compare this to base 58 where you really need a big num logic to turn the whole thing in a huge number and then uh, convert it to a new basis and so on, which is a quadratic algorithm. Um, for all of that, we, we get a downside. It is 17% larger than base 58, just due to being uh, less information fitting in one character. <coughs> and, uh, and that's going to be the main topic of the discussion I'll be talking about is um, due to 32 being a prime power we can, which supports a mathematical field over the characters, uh, we can use a lot of research on, on strong error detection codes, uh, which doesn't exist for something like 58. And uh, due to being case insensitive, it is also more compact to store in QR codes, which have a special mode for encoding alphanumeric data. Uh, but that this only works for case-insensitive things. Base32 is also being used already for many use cases already, including uh, onion addresses in Tor and I2P and, and several other projects. So then, uh, going on, we, we, we fix the idea that we're going to use Base32 for all these uh, reasons. Uh, what are we going to do about the checksum character set and the structure? Um, first, I should point out a few design decisions we fix early on. Um, we want a... All of this will be about the, the chance of misdetecting an invalid address as, an, as a valid address, because when that happens, you'll be sending money into a black hole. That's what we want to prevent. And uh, six characters is the minimum we need to make the chance that a random string gets accepted as an address less than one in a billion. So that's just a design choice, six characters, that's what we're going with. Um, this means if this address type is going to be generic for every uh, witness output, which uh, can have up to 320 bits of data, uh, we really need 71 characters under the checksum. So we'll be looking for error detecting codes that uh, detect as many errors as possible with a checksum of length 6 uh, with a total message of length 71. And I'm now going to look at a, a few of the design choices we went through and ending up with the one we picked, the BCH code at the end. Um, first, I need to clarify the concept of distance. Uh, anyone who knows something about uh, coding theory, and this will be trivial, but I'll, I'll um, explain it anyway. So the, the distance of a code, or the minimum distance of a code, or the hemming distance of a code, is how many characters within a valid address you need to at least change to turn it into an other valid address. Basically, the, the minimum number of different characters between two different addresses. And um, here, uh, this uh, diagram gives a nice demonstration. Uh, all the lines are single character changes and all the black dots are valid addresses. So can someone tell me, uh, it's already on the slide. Um, the minimum distance of, of the code shown here is four. You need to at least cross four black lines between any two black dots. Um, there's a, a very fundamental theorem that says if your distance is n, you can detect up to, up to n minus 1 errors. And this is really obvious to see. Uh, if you start from any of these black dots and you make up to 3 errors, you follow up to 3 black lines, you never end up with another black dot. So this shows you how a distance 4 code can detect 3 errors. And there's also an equivalence if you have a code that can detect and errors, it can also correct n minus 2 errors. Um, you can just see that as uh, from any point in the diagram, you go to the closest black dot. And if you are on a black dot that is on, uh, on an intersection point that is a distance 2 from uh, a number of black dots, there are multiple choices you can make. So you cannot correct two errors, but you can correct one. If they were all five apart, you could correct two. Um, and really what we'll be looking for is things that are five apart. <clears throat> so, the 
first thing uh, to look at is CRC codes. They're the most traditional checksum algorithm used in, in a wide variety of protocols. Um, however, they are bit-based. And uh, this makes sense because in most protocols what we care about are bit errors. However, here this is not the case. We don't directly care about bit errors, we care about symbol errors or character errors. Whenever someone makes a mistake, they will make an entire character at one, and every character is five bits. So here is an example where the B is turned into a J and the D is turned into a V. And even though this is only two characters that are changed, you can see that it's actually nine bits that are changed. Now, CRC are, are designed to optimize for uh, detecting a number of bit errors, which means if we want something that can detect um, four errors, uh, we really need something that can uh, detect 20 bit errors, which is a lot. But um, turns out finding something that can detect 20 bit errors is impossible. But we don't really care about that. We really care about these symbol errors, which result in bit errors that are somewhat structured. They always appear, occur in groups of five, and we care about the number of groups that are wrong, not just the bits. And um, so it is, in fact, possible to find the CRC that gives us distance four, but um, we can do better. OK, the, the probably best known type of checksum algorithms that allow error correction are Reed-Solomon codes. And these work directly over symbols, uh, which is great. Unfortunately, they are limited in length to the size of the alphabet minus one. Typically, Reed-Solomon codes are done over 8-bit data, which means that they can work over code words of length 255, which is 2 to the power of 8 minus 1. But in our case, our alphabet size is, is 32, We're using base 32, which means we'd be limited to uh, doing error detection in strings of length 31. And this is too short. We, we cannot fit enough data into that. So a possibility is to use an alphabet extension, extension where you're really looking at two characters at once and uh, are really doing a size 1024, which is 2 to the 10th uh, alphabet. You see two characters in your code as one, one symbol. Um, and this is possible, however, it's still limited to distance 4. And we're really trying to see is there nothing better we can, we can get. Um, so then, um, about a year ago, we uh, found out about BCH codes, which are a generalization of Reed-Solomon code that drop this restriction of being limited to the alphabet size minus one. Uh, it's also not, most of the research on BCH code is actually about uh, bit, bit based ones, but this is not, that not necessary, and a lot of the research is applicable to, to larger ones as well. So we're going to create a BCH code over our size 32 alphabets. And in fact, it turns out that uh, the theory, which you can read about, there are nice articles on Wikipedia and everything. Um, if you do the math, you can construct a BCH code with distance five. Yay! Um, I'll, I'll soon, soon show you a diagram to, to show why this actually matters. Um, turns out there's still a huge design space. Many parameters are free in this, in this BCH uh, cl class of codes, so we'll need a, a way to, to figure out which one to use, right? Mm. Uh, turns out, even if you fix the, the field size, uh, there are actually about 160,000 different ones. And when confronted with this, I uh, thought, well, this, this is, uh, how are we ever going to pick one? And I uh, started trying to do random sampling and see which one are actually better, even if you give it more errors than they're designed for. So uh, these are codes that are designed for uh, having distance four or five, meaning they will detect three or four errors. But what if you give them one more error? Uh, probably, if these are all different codes, some of them are actually better if you go beyond their limits than they're not. Um, so we started on this, this project on, of trying to characterize all the different codes that are possible here. Um, so you ask maybe, how do you 
characterize such a code because all 71 character addresses is that ridiculously large number that we need to go over to, to characterize them. Uh, this is about three, two to the power of 350, so way, way, way beyond what, what you know, <laughs> number of, of atoms in the universe. Um, however, BCH codes belong to a class called linear codes. Linear codes means if you have a valid code word and you look at the values that every character represents and pairwise you add every character to another valid code word, the sum will again be a valid code word. So um, what you really only need to look for is if you want to see, oh, does, is this code uh, maybe below distance 5, you need to check um, does there exist any pair of four non-zero values over the 71 positions whose checksum is zero. Because if that is the case, you can add that to any valid code word and the result will be another valid code word and now we have established a two valid code word with distance four. Um, turns out that still 12 trillion combinations, which is painfully large, maybe not entirely impossible, but uh, more than we were able to do. Um, and the next realization is that you can use a collision search. Instead of uh, looking for actually four errors, what you do is you look for only two, you build a table with all the uh, results on two errors, compute what their checksum would be to correct it, sort that table, and then look whether there are any two identical ones. Because now you have two um, code words that need the same checksum to correct it, and if you XOR them, if you add them together, now you have two times two, you have four changes, and the, ch and the, the checksum cancels out. So through this collision search, you can now find uh, by only doing the square root of the amount of work, which ma makes it feasible. So, um, and then there are a bunch of other optimizations on top, which I may talk about later if there's uh, interest. So, um, we're able to do some search, and okay, we start from this 160,000 codes. Let's require that they actually have distance five at, at length uh, 71, and yeah, there are 28,000 left. Which one to pick from now? Um, what you want to do is then look at. Sorry. Um, you're going to look at, at how they behave at one beyond the limit. So we, the, all of these codes, these 28,000 codes, they all detect four errors at length 71. But what if you give them five errors? And what if you give them five errors that are uh, maybe only appearing in a burst very close together, or you give them uh, randomly distributed and these get all different uh, behaviors. And it turns out if, if uh, we, we pick some reasonable assumptions about uh, how we weigh uh, the, the random case versus the burst case, there are 310 best ones that are identical. And to, to, to show you how much this matters, I want to show this graph that uh, contains a lot of information, so I'll go uh, through it. What this graph shows you is the detection power of um, a particular error detection code in function of the chance that every character individually is wrong. This makes the assumption that, that every character is, is independent for, from every other. Um, so, for example, you can see that the 1% line um, the, the, the red line is, is the error detection code we, we chose. So uh, you can see it's about uh, two, to the mi 2 to the power of minus 38, which means that's 1 in 250 billion, the chance that uh, an error you make would not be detected. The blue line is what the 32-bit hash function would do as the current address format, the base 58. Does it? it uh, uh, and, and you can see it, it. It doesn't matter what what your error rate is, and any error has exactly the same chance of being detected. But 
we can reasonably assume that the average number of errors to be expected within an address is, is not large. We can assume that it's maybe one in address, hopefully even less than, than, than one, especially if we switch to case insensitive coding, um, it, it, it would be, become even less likely. Um, and uh, the yellow line shows what we could have chosen. If, if we didn't do this exhaustive analysis to find the best one, the yellow line is actually the worst possible code, uh, where you can see it has this, this uh, annoying bump where its detection probability even goes below 1 to over 2 to the 30. So we, we don't even guarantee this 1 in a billion chance for that code. So uh, this is just to show you, uh, one, uh, how great uh, optimizing for a low number of errors is because it, it, it gives you, un under these assumptions, a much better model. But it also shows you how much it matters to, to, to do this analysis. Uh, it, it, it clearly makes a difference. Um, so from those 310, uh, we, we picked the codes with the best uh, bit error rate behavior because we, we still have these 310 identical codes for in, in number of how many characters can be wrong, they behave identically, no, just no difference at all. So we still need some criterion to, to, to pick one and we have all this analysis available anyway, so, so what to pick? And it will be, uh, soon become clear why it is useful to optimize for a low bit error rate. So um, what this means is what if we're only looking at errors that uh, change one bit in a character? Um, how, how does the code behave then? They're, they're f for, for random errors, they're, they're, they're identical anyway. So, uh, and now we only have two left and we just pick one of them. Um, this took many, many years of CPU times. Uh, I, thankfully, we have something like 200 CPU cores uh, available to, to do analysis on. Uh, so this only took a couple weeks, but um, in, in total it was more than 10 years of, of uh, computation time to think it. Until we discovered that really these 310 identical ones, it, it's a pattern. All codes appear in groups of 310 identical ones. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, when we identified what, what these exact changes was, were uh, suddenly a lot became, a lot more became feasible to analyze, and we were no longer restricted to, to those 160,000 BCH code. We could, in fact, look at all the 3.6 million six-character uh, cyclic codes, which is a, a much larger class of, of functions, and uh, turns out that if you make the, the range of things you're looking for larger, you find better things. Um, however, we did not pick anything from this. The, the, the results from this search, indeed, uh, which was now feasible after uh, dividing by 310, because we could, fr from each class, just test one. Uh, so instead of uh, otherwise uh, a billion uh, codes, there was only 3.6 million left. Uh, turns out some of them were slightly better than what we had already found, but we're not changing it for the reason that there are efficient error location algorithms available for these BCH codes that aren't available if you pick an arbitrary code. And the difference isn't much, so we're sticking to it. Okay, um, so now the question of the character set. There exist various character sets for base 32 already. There's the uh, RFC 45 something, which is a standard. There's the Z base 32 standard. There's a, uh, various other standards for base 32 data that have been used in the past. And uh, we're still going to pick a different one. And the reason for this is we were able to select our code to optimize for low bit error rates. So wouldn't it be great if we could choose the character set in such a way that one bit errors are more likely than non one bit errors. And this character set is the, the result of uh, another year of CPU time to, to optimize for this. 
Uh, we found a bunch of uh, information on tables for similarity between various characters. And so what you can see in this, this thing is, for example, uh, the Z and the 2 are considered similar in some fonts or writing. And um, as you can see, they are uh, 8 apart. One is a 2 and the other is 10, so they are 1 bit apart. And R and T are one bit apart, and Y and V are one bit apart, and X and K are one bit apart, and E and A are one bit apart, a different one. And the S and the 5 are one bit apart, the 4 and the H are one bit apart. And so this, this whole, th there are way more uh, si similar pairs uh, overlaid in, in this that uh, you can look for. Um, so it, it's pretty cool. We, we made a character set that basically optimizes for one-bit errors. And as a result, our code is actually distance 6 for one-bit errors. If you just look at, at these one-bit errors, we guarantee five errors. If you only make errors like this, you, you can detect five. And here is another diagram. Do you take into account QWERTY keyboard distance? Sorry, Brian? Do you take into account QWERTY keyboard distance? We did not take QWERTY keyboard distance uh, in, into account. So we, we considered it, but the, uh, the visual component is uniform. And in some rather informal testing, it looked like the uh, visual component was more commonly a source of errors. But the visual component is almost always in the signal path, whereas a, a QWERTY keyboard may not be in the signal path. Yeah, Greg, Greg points out that most of the errors are or Maybe we should, you should repeat the question after, and, and you can repeat it through the microphone if people haven't, haven't heard it. Um, so what this diagram shows you, the blue line is again what a 32-bit hash as the current address format would do. The red line is for arbitrary errors um, using the, the, the checksum algorithm we've chosen. And the purple line is the same thing for the address for, uh, for the checksum algorithm we chose, but restricted to one-bit errors. So if you only make this class of errors that we consider more likely, you can see that it's even stronger. Uh, for 1%, you can see you get another five bit of detection chance, making it 32 times less likely to for something like that to not be detected. Um, something else you can see on this diagram is the, the line for one expected error in the whole address. Um, you can see there's a crossover point at 3.53. So, uh, what this means is that the checksum algorithm, despite being shorter, it's only a 32-30-bit 30 uh, checksum. Despite that, uh, for up to 3.5 expected errors in your whole address, it is actually stronger than the 32-bit checksum that was being used in, in the base 58. And for uh, only likely errors, it is even up to 4.85 per address. So, great win. Um, then, one last thing. How, how do we combine all of that into a real address? Because now uh, we have a character set and we, we, we have a checksum algorithm. Uh, how are we going to structure SegWit addresses? Um, consists of three major parts. The first is the human readable part, which for Bitcoin addresses in our proposal will be BC, standing for Bitcoin. Um, in, for testnet, it is uh, TB, which is still only two characters, but, but visually distinct from BC. Um, then there's a separator, which is always one, and one is a character that does not appear in the character set. So this uh, means that um, the human readable part is always unambiguously separated from the data that follows, even if the human readable part itself contains a one. Uh, so that makes it extra flexible. And then there is a data part which uses the character set as I described above, below, no, before. Um, and for SegWit addresses, but this is generic, um, in there is the data, the, the witness version, the witness program, and the checksum, which is the last check six characters, uh, as I showed. The result of this for a pay to witness pub key hash address would be 42 characters rather than 34, so it's a bit longer. Uh, um, base 32 is a bit less efficient, the checksum is longer, uh, and uh, the prefix of two characters add, adds up. 
Um, but I don't expect this to be a big problem. It is slightly larger, but it is more compact in QR codes. It's much easier to read and write, and anything that that doesn't, only things that care about visual space really, this matters. It's 62 for pay to witness script hash because it uses 256 bit hashes rather than 160 for higher security. And for future witness versions, which support up to 320 bit hashes, the length can go up to 74, though I don't really expect there will be used. 256 bit is a very reasonable security target. Um, so, all of this together gives Bash32, which is a generic data format for things like addresses and then one instance of it for the use of, of um, SegWit addresses. But it, it could be used for various other things that have similar uh, requirements. Uh, I don't know what, but uh, th this is... Um, it, it, it seems strange that um, most of the research you can find on checksum human readable data uses like one checksum character or two checksum characters. Think about uh, bank account numbers or uh, a few similar things and, and there seems to be very little research on, on how to make an actually strong checksum that is still designed for human consumption. So I, I hope this, this can become a perhaps a standard for, for how to do this. Um, there's a link to the BIP address. Um, in all of this, I have not mentioned one of the most important design goals was sim code com simplicity. Um, because I've been talking about these error detection codes which are typically very complicated to deal with. However, they're only complicated to deal with if you're actually interested in error correction. Um, Error detection is trivial. Ta da! Uh, the, the, this is the checksum algorithm. It uses no big, big num conversion, it has no SHA 256 dependencies, it's just these 10 lines. Of course, you need more for the character set conversion and, and converting uh, to, to bytes for the witness program, but really the mathematical part of the spec is just this. Um, and I will also show you, sorry for making you seasick, um, what we did make. Oops. So we also made a small demo website um, that shows how this, um, because it is an actual error correction algorithm behind the scenes even we're not using it, you could optionally implement it to do error location. And the spec allows this, it, it strongly advises against doing actual error correction because if someone types an address wrong, you want to go complain and tell the user to go look what the address is and not try to correct it for them because they might end up with a valid address that's not the one they intended. Um, but so here's a, an example. So say you uh, change this V to an X. Uh, it will point out that this X is likely what you did wrong. And this can even be inside the checksum. Uh, the algorithm on this website can s supports up to two. We have an algorithm that supports up to three, but it uh, not most of the times, but still f quite frequently wrong. Um, and there are ways to deal with this, like showing multiple possibilities to the user, but uh, none of the contributors to this project are great UI people, so we really didn't know how to, to do this. Um, okay. Here's a P2WSH example as well. So this, this website is linked from the BIP. You can play with it if you're interested. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Do we have some questions? 
and wait for the mic. Um, so, like, do you have any idea how many Bitcoin are lost per year due to uh, the like human readable um, the character mistakes that, that, that this corrects for? I have no idea. I expect it to be low, but I also expect it that we wouldn't know about it. Um, so it, it, it's hard to, to quantify and it's very nice to just categorically improve the, the, the state of the art there. Uh, in the error location code, can it suggest corrections there? Yes, the, the location code actually does full error correction. It knows what the likely error is, but it intentionally does not show you. Because you should go back and look what it should be rather than try things. Explain the distance part and why. So, uh, Greg suggests that uh, I, I explain why this matters. Um, and a code with distance d can either detect d minus 1 errors or correct d minus 1 over 2. This means that uh, our code, which is distance 5, can uh, detect four errors, but can only correct two. This, mean, this, this is because you can be in the middle of two valid code words and then you don't know which one to go. So if you make uh, four errors, which will never result in a valid code word, you may, however, gotten closer to another valid code word than the one you started off from. And um, so th this means that you, your ability to do error detection is eroded by trying to do correction. If, if you... The, the key point to make here is that if you make four errors, it will almost certainly correct it to a valid address which is not the address you intended, yeah. which is why you don't want to correct the errors. As Craig points out, so if, if you make four errors uh, and run the error correction algorithm, which can make up to two, it will correct, in fact, to the wrong thing with very high probability. Uh, with four, it's almost certain. With three, it's likely. With two, never. Um, so this is, for example, different when you're dealing with private keys. Maybe that's something I should mention as, as future work. Uh, we're also looking at a similar standard like the one here for encoding private keys. But for private keys, telling the user, sorry, your private key is wrong, that's not what you want. You, you really want to do the error correction there. Um, so we're, there we're looking at something with, with a stronger checksum that, that uh, has, has more than six characters extra, but actually can correct a reasonable number of errors and not just detect them. Uh, thanks for presenting. Oh. Sorry. Uh, I was just wondering, that the private key thing made me wonder whether this could be used also for master keys uh, at the root of BIP32, yes. or if there's something similar to it? Um, so the um, checksum algorithm we chose here ends up being really good up to length 89. It was designed to be good up to 71. It turns out it is really good up to 89, not more. Um, which is approximately 450 bits of data. And that is um, enough for a seed, but not enough for a master key, which has 512 bits of entropy because it has a chain code as well as a key. Um, so future work is, is looking for a stronger checksum, which is uh, both can correct an, a reasonable number of errors for short things like private keys, but also has good performance for longer things. Um, and, and given that we're talking about longer strings there anyway, you don't care whether it adds 6 or, or 10 or 15 characters. Right? Could uh, the Bash 32 implicitly supporting SegWit in the practice of false signaling, say where liners are signaling for something other than core while running 
core in the background? That, that's completely orthogonal. So all of what I've been talking about here is on the wallet implementation side. It has no relation at all to what is implemented in consensus rules, full nodes, peer-to-peer -peer protocol, miners. None of this cares about it. This is just something that, that wallets need to implement if they want. So, no. Peter, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned um, that there were some proposals that would completely abstract Bitcoin addresses away from users. Can you just talk briefly about what those might be oh, or yeah, things sure. that you might find that are promising? So, <laughs> I won't say promising, but uh, the only proposal that, that, that had some traction in the past is BIP70, BIP uh, which is the payment protocol uh, you may have heard about, which, which um, really turns, in, instead of having an address, you have a file that is a, pay, a payment descriptor and your address becomes a URL to that file. And because in almost all cases where a Bitcoin transaction is taking place, the user is already interacting or the sender is already interacting with the recipient anyway. So why do we need an, an, an address? They're, they're on their website. They can just give the information through that to, to the software. Um, this doesn't solve any of the problems of, of uh, well, what if your website is being intercepted, but neither do addresses. Uh, so um, complications with, with this is, is I think some, some uh, mistakes that were made in, in, uh, in the specification of this that makes it less useful than, than it could have been. Uh, there's not all that much software that really implements it. It's hard to implement. It requires uh, uh, SSL uh, certificates. Um, so the, it, something in that direction, I, I think, would be great if it were done with what we've learned so far about this. But it, it may be very hard to get something like that adopted. I'm not very hopeful, unfortunately. With this uh, implementation, does RIPE 160 still come into it, or is it? Um, so that is, um, yes, it does. Um, because um, so pay to witness pubkey hash addresses still contain a RIPE MD 160 hash of the public key being sent to. Um, so that is part of the SegWit proposal that, that's, that doesn't really have anything to do with, with this address type, which abstracts over any data. But um, yes, the data being encoded in the address for a witness pubkey hash is a RIPEMD160. It's no longer for, for script hash. It's just SHA256 there. Um, so I'm uh, curious if you have done any um, optimization in terms of the classic uh, spelling error correction style of finding, like for example, what if I miss one character and end up adding a second one at a later point? How would how would it deal with that? I think Greg should answer this question. Uh, yes. So what you're describing, where someone drops a character and inserts a character, they end up with the correct length. What this results in is a burst of errors, all confined within the short space between the span where they, where they drop them. So although Peter didn't talk about it, the codes that we use are also selected by virtue of their construction to have uh, very good properties for small bursts as well. And so uh, they do detect uh, then, then by chance uh, than you would expect from it being a 30-bit check. It's useful hints for the drop and insert case. Yeah, I wanted to show uh, the bib itself, but unfortunately, I don't seem to have internet connection. Yeah, there, there's oh. a table in the in the bib that gives so all of the errors occurring in the window, which is specifically interesting for this case because shorter windows are more common for uh, first errors, just from a counting argument. So with uh, traditional Bitcoin addresses, you have the one and the three and they tell the wallet what type of uh, yep. script pub key. In, in this case, it's the length that determines what? No, it, it, it isn't. So uh, in this slide, the queue you see in red is the witness version. 
Um, so all of it is SegWit outputs, um, but SegWit outputs have a version number and a hash, and this version number, and in combination with the length. So both uh, pay to witness pubkey hash and pay to witness script hash use version zero, but one uses 20 bytes of hash and the other uses 32 bytes. Commenting a little more on the length, so so basically, um, because future SegWit versions may use different lengths, the specification uh, allows the lengths to be many possible lengths, and there's some validation code on what lengths are allowed. Not not every possible length is an allowed length, just as a as a result of the eight bit to five bit conversion that occurs between the with the two sizes. Um, it, it's also important that th this address type intentionally makes an abstraction so while the, the former thing using the one or the three selected pay to pubkey hash or pay to script hash um, someone implementing the address type does not really need to know about the existence of wallet pubkey a witness pubkey hash or, or witness script hash it's just a version number and data and uh, it, it sort of the sender even shouldn't care about what what is in there. It's the, the, the receiver's business. Yeah. Yeah, there are some sanity checks you can do if you know more. But. Yeah, we, we generally consider it a flaw that the sender knows anything about what kind of scheme that the receiver is using. And so, yeah, that we try to abstract that away. Okay, hey, uh, I think I'm missing something really basic, but um, what's the probability, how does the probability change for address collisions from the old um, addresses to the new? Uh, what do you mean by address collision exactly? Um, so the, the chances of, t of you generating two addresses on the old system are uh, absolutely minuscule. Uh, does this increase the probability that no, two so people there, there, there's same. still 160 bit or 256 bits of, of data inside the address, and that's the only thing that matters. Yeah. So the, all of this is about the checksum, not about the data in the addresses, which is still using traditional hash functions. Uh, so nothing changes there if you're using a 160 bit one. It goes even dramatically down if you're using 256 bits, because now you, you have something proportional to 2 to the power of one, minus 128 rather than 2 to the minus 80. Collision. Any other questions? Do you see any applications outside Bitcoin for this? Like maybe it'll help with marketing? Maybe what? Maybe it'll help with marketing a little bit. <laughs> um, um, anything where humans are dealing with crypto, small strings of cryptographic material. Uh, so the example I, I gave already that, that uses base32 is, is uh, onion addresses in Tor, for example. Uh, so I don't know if they're interested in, but it, something similar could, could be applicable there. Um, they, they have different requirements for error detection, I guess. It, it isn't all that bad if you accidentally. Um, and maybe also important to point out, this does not really prevent intentionally similar looking addresses. We, we have this guarantee that any two valid addresses differ in at least five characters, which makes it somewhat hard for an attacker to generate two similar looking ones. But making that many characters similar is, is just computationally due to there's a hash function uh, being there already very hard. So. Sorry, there was not really an answer to your question. But. Any more questions? Um, are most of the design decisions around things like the character map uh, and the, um, the sort of code generator, are they documented along with the bit? Yeah, they're, they're briefly, uh, but there's a rationale section that uh, explains why many of the decisions were made. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, is, is there any way to use this scheme for traditional 
uh, pay to pub key or pay to script hash? Uh, intentionally not, as I think it would be a very confusing thing if there were multiple encodings, multiple addresses that refer to the same outputs. You, you might get uh, someone uses one form of address because that's what their wallet does, but then they go to a block explorer website which shows into another but because it can't know which one was intended and that isn't compatible with the software. And, and, and that, that's just, I, I think we should, we should think of addresses as the thing you are sending to. It happens to map to a particular script pub key, but we shouldn't have see it as just an encoding of some data uh, that can be confusing. I know it's super early, but you have you talked to any wallet um, implementers about this? Yep. Yes. Um, so while designing this, we've talked to various people before publishing it, uh, in particular uh, Green Address, uh, Armory, um, Electrum. Um, there have been, been comments from various others. Many of them helped make improvements to the proposal as well. Yeah, so many of them gave suggestions. I'm sure they appreciate the simplicity. I hope so. <laughs> I've, I've gotten comments from like, oh, you're using an error detection algorithm. This is, uh, you need to implement new cryptography. I'm like, oh, you mean these 10 lines of code? <laughs> One of which is a comment. <laughs> Correct. In, 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 in practice, you need to implement more than that, of course. But the, the whole reference implementation for encoding and decoding in Python is 120 lines. <laughs> okay. I, do we have room for one more question? Uh, Peter, thank you for presenting. Um, there is quite a few entrepreneurs in the room, and what is your opinion on everyone not caring about Bitcoin anymore and flipping to Ethereum? <laughs> People do what they want. Uh, okay. Thank you, Peter, for your wonderful talk. You're welcome.